This week in Starbase, Sean got us an awesome fresh look at the flame trench parts for the new ship static fire stand at the Massey's Outpost. Plus, there are some huge changes happening at the orbital tank farm as SpaceX continues to prepare for Starship Flight 4. Speaking of which, when is that happening again? Let's take a step back and look at where everything stands. Howdy, Star fans. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. Let's start off our weekly overview at the production site, as is tradition. Here we can see that work is ongoing on the new parking garage, which will soon help alleviate the need for workers to park on the side of Highway 4. Parking can be exceptionally bad around the production site, so more parking is sorely needed. In the background, we also still have ships 26, 32, and 20. The middle one, 32, is the final version 1 Starship, at least as far as we know and as an upcoming flight vehicle, it's always worth keeping a close eye on it. Alas, there's nothing major to report with Ship 32 this week, so let's move right along. Later in the week, concrete was poured for the parking structure's ground level. It seems like the structure will begin to rise up out of the ground very soon. I can't help but find it pretty amusing that even though it's going to be a fairly large parking structure, it's going to look really small next to the high bay and mega bays. While new construction abounds at Starbase, we also still get glimpses of the remains of older vehicles and an older Starbase. Here is Booster 4's aft section. At this point, it's an extremely outdated design, which is exemplified by the hydraulic power units, which are still present on this booster. Over at the Star Factory, the roof has almost reached the final section closest to the high bay. The main structure is being finished, and soon we will no longer see surface work on the Star Factory. Of course, that is only if the expansion stops here. Maybe we'll see further changes to the area in the future, depending on what SpaceX's final plan is for the production site. Star Factory is already partially operational, of course, and here we can see an elliptical dome section inside the factory, with a booster forward section right behind it. Development hardware is already in and around Star Factory for Starship version 2, and this is all happening while the expansion is still being built. Speaking of hardware, a booster landing tank used for, well, the landing burn, and a transfer tube, that's right, I said transfer tube, not downcomer, because that's what it's called on all of the SpaceX labels that we've seen, were spotted outside of the Star Factory. It's unclear which vehicles these are for, though. The landing tanks help to reserve the propellants for landing and keep it from sloshing around inside of the larger tank. That landing tank was lifted a bit later in the day, and you can see it on a transport stand here. If you're wondering where this part is going, well, the landing tank is situated around the transfer tube, and its installation requires the tank to be lifted and then moved over the transfer tube, which is exactly the maneuver we see right here. Checking in with the new office building, there's been no significant progress as of yet between now and our last update. It seems that some of the wall and or roof parts are being installed, but that's about it. Next up, SPMTs at Starbase are typically seen moving ships and boosters around the production and launch sites. But you know what they can also be? Just transporters for hardware. Cables, steel pipes, GSE like the two-point lifter or the taco stand and dance floor. SPMTs are useful for a lot more than just transporting giant rockets. Sticking with the production site, Ship 30 remains on the engine installation stand inside Mega Bay 2. This is where its aft end will be worked on and its Raptor engines installed. It's always cool to see the evolution of the machine that builds the machine, and this stand, well, stands in stark contrast to previous versions of this type of hardware. You can see it's enclosed and has multiple layers of what I assume to be a clean room-like environment. This is a far cry from building rockets in a tent on a sandbar in the middle of nowhere. Ship 30 will potentially be up for flight in just a few months from now, so we'll keep our eyes on it for any progress. Next up, at the Sanchez lot, where tower sections 8 and 9 remain parked, it seems like work on these sections has resumed lately, as evidenced by the workers present on them. It remains to be seen when the tower sections currently parked at the port of Brownsville will be transported next to their pals at Sanchez, or, for that matter, when the final two sections will make their journey from Florida to Texas. But SpaceX still has plenty of groundwork to get through at the suborbital launch site before they're really needed, so nothing to worry about here. And don't fret, we will talk about that exact groundwork in 
just a minute. Now, let's talk about the Massey Outpost and what exactly is going on there. Thanks to its location next to the Rio Grande River, a good way to get a different view of things at Massey's is by using a boat. At the future ship static fire area, many cranes are present. This is the place where we spotted the flame bucket in our last update. In the future, SpaceX will start static firing ships here instead of on suborbital pad B. And for that, SpaceX is trying to future-proof its design by installing heavy hardware like a flame trench to make sure that use of this facility is sustainable. We certainly don't want any more shattering of Martite to sever avionics cables and, I don't know, almost lead to the loss of a vehicle. I'm looking at you, SN8 and suborbital pad A. Also in this area, another thing we can spot is additional hardware used to fuel a starship. Recondensers, vaporizers, tanks, all things we see at the suborbital and orbital launch sites in Starbase, and all things that are needed to perform ship static fires at the outpost. Massey's is shaping up to be quite a significant facility over time, as it becomes an essential part of the Starbase vehicle testing flow. Really, it already is in terms of cryogenic proof testing for both ship and booster, and that significance will only grow with this new static fire stand. Speaking of the static fire stand, one of the coolest things that Sean spotted on this outing was the flame diverter. This is one piece of the full assembly that will be used on the ship static fire stand. You can see it looks, to use a technical term, beefy as heck. But it needs to be, given that it will need to deflect the power of six and later nine Raptor engines, all directed right at it. Pretty neat to see up close. It looks like the part is staged right near where it will be installed, while it's being worked on. So once SpaceX is ready to install the diverter, it won't have to move far. The pipe features a lot of small holes, and one can imagine it's a lot like the Delu system at the orbital launch mount, but curved to help reflect the energy from the Raptors outward during firings. It's almost like it's a mix of a deluge system and a flame trench. Maybe a deluge trench? Uh, no, no, we'll, we'll workshop it, I'll get back to you. More of the testing setup was actually moved a day later. This is the QD assembly for the testing quick disconnect being moved. Now let's move here and get into Starship Flight 4 preparations. Specifically, most of the work in the last week has been focused on the chopsticks. Last week, we saw some actuator replacements on them, and it seems like there is still more work to do before Flight 4. Or maybe even SpaceX is just using the time before Flight 4 to future-proof and upgrade the chopsticks. Before Flight 4, SpaceX will need to fully check out the entire Mechazilla system again, as it's obviously needed to raise the booster and ship onto the orbital launch mount. So it'll have to be fixed relatively soon if flight is going to happen sometime in May. Perhaps this will even be a good indicator of the imminent return of vehicles to the launch site. Once they start testing the chopsticks, we should be close. Work on the chopsticks was not limited to just the area of the actuators. The front of the sticks, where the catching mechanism is, also had some crews up in lifts doing work on them from time to time. Finally on the chopstick front, the left chopstick, equipped with its new actuator, was moved a bit. It seems like some early steps to verify its functionality. We'll have to wait and see when the right chopstick moves as well, but for now, at least the left one has started moving again. Remember, the other actuator also still needs to be replaced and then tested, so still a bit more to do. The booster QD and its cover also had some more work done on them this week. This includes the removal of one of the recently installed flex hoses. It's not clear if SpaceX will replace more parts of it, but at this point, I wouldn't rule it out. These hoses, interestingly, have been a focus of work now for weeks, and it seems like there was some significant damage done to them during Flight 3 that necessitated all of this effort. Next up, the orbital launch mount, which still has the dance floor below it. The dance floor functions as a giant work platform inside the mount for SpaceX workers to access the booster holddown clamps and whatever else they need to work on. The connectors between pad and holddowns have still not been reinstalled, as far as we can tell, so it seems like SpaceX is performing more work on the holddowns themselves. Now let's check in on the last big piece of ground support equipment that needs to be ready for Starship Flight 4, and that is the ship QD. In contrast to previous weeks, there actually has been some work done on it lately, but it seems relatively minor. Here, you can see some insulation on the propellant lines was replaced to make sure the cryogenics are properly insulated. This will prevent any extra boil off, and with that, make fueling more predictable and more efficient. In this shot, you can see how complex it all is. All of this is needed to supply, power, and communicate with the ship during testing and during the countdown to launch. Over at the orbital tank farm Berm, we can see the latest addition to it still curing. 
Perhaps SpaceX decided that based on the latest analysis of the super heavy exhaust plume, this addition is necessary. Or again, maybe they're just doing some more future proofing here while they have time ahead of the next flight. And yet more concrete work is coming. SpaceX crews are putting more concrete forms in place at the area where the horizontal tanks of the tank farm are. This is where we see a lot of rebar being installed lately. And after this, the tank farm will be walled off even more from the public road right next to it. Some of the smaller tanks were modified a bit this week as well. This part of the recondensing system had a part cut off the top and it's unclear why. Starbase's second Starship orbital pad is still in early work. We saw yet more groundwork this week as SpaceX made sure the foundation of the area is safe and sound before putting anything heavy on it. Since Boca Chica is basically a swamp and tends to contain a lot of groundwater in the soil, a lot of groundwork is needed to compress the area and wick out the moisture first before putting foundations in and on it. That is the step where the second pad is at right now. The $100 question here is how long this ground preparation will take and your guess is as good as mine, so put it in the comments and let us know what you think. While these last two flights have been way less destructive than the first one, there is still a ton of debris to collect in the aftermath. SpaceX continues to clean up debris from the previous flights in the dunes here behind the road at the launch pad. Moving right along, a major overhaul of the orbital tank farm continues to progress. SpaceX is finally starting to remove the vertical tanks in the tank farm, but do not fret. This is why SpaceX brought in all the new horizontal or hot dog tanks to replace the vertical ones over time. It just seems like now the time has finally come where the vertical tanks are not needed anymore. And that is the reason why the SpaceX LR11000 crane was already staged next to the tank farm. It's needed to remove the tank shells. The crane was then attached to one of the GSE tanks. This is to give it stability as they're starting to remove it and cut it open. And then the cutting started. You can see them here starting to cut the shell in half. Goodbye, GSE tank. Interestingly, they're not cutting it horizontally. Instead, they just cut a chunk out of it. With the tight fit of the tank farm, it's hard to access some areas of the tanks, so this makes sense. The tank was then later cut in half, moved by the crane off to the side, where it was unceremoniously chopped up for scrap. Closing out the week at the launch site, we saw the new wall getting some more concrete. It seems like there's no end in sight to wall building in Starbase. The big ticket item every week is, of course, where are we in the flow toward the next Starship flight? Thankfully, this week we have some more observations in this regard. A hot staging ring featuring a dome in the middle is present at the production site. Since it's next in line, we can assume that this is for Booster 11, which is still lacking a hot stage ring and thus is the last major part of the booster that still needs to be installed. Here it looks like a worker is working on parts of the clamps which will attach to the ship. Of course I could be wrong and this could be the test article again, but hard to say without getting a closer look at it. Now we can't talk about the full stack for the next Starship flight without talking about Ship 29, so let's do exactly that. Ship 29 still doesn't have all of its tiles. It's missing a lot around the flap area and it appears many more are being inspected. I wonder if SpaceX is just in no hurry to get this next flight vehicle ready, or maybe they're merely trying their hardest to ensure Ship 29's heat shield is in as good a shape as possible. Either way, you better believe we're keeping a close eye on Ship 29 inside the high bay. Closer to the end of the week, a worker was working on the tiles close to the giant gap that currently exists on Ship 29, but they weren't replacing them just inspecting them. You can see him marking on some of the tiles with a marker depending on the result of that inspection. So the inevitable question always is, when flight? At this point, I'm beginning to suspect that a launch in the first half of May is off the table. So sorry to all you Star Wars fans who wanted a launch on May the 4th. I think a launch sometime in May is still possible, but at this point, it's really hard to guess how things will go. Let's hope that next week we can tell you something about vehicles rolling out and getting ready for flight. But even if that doesn't end up being the case, it's simply remarkable that I'm recording this video one year to the day since the first integrated flight test, and we're already on the cusp of flight four. This is exactly the pace of development we all want to see here in Starbase. Breakneck speed, pedal to the metal, all in on the future of spaceflight. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.